Welcome to another of our special VLGA Connect Summer Series episodes, and I am delighted to have with us today the CEO of the Committee for Melbourne, Martine Letts. Martine, nice to see you and thanks for joining us. Thanks, Chris. Nice to be speaking to you. A couple of things we wanted to chat to you about, the East Coast mega region concept, which I think is really exciting. Um, mm -hmm. We might just park that for a moment because uh, also very exciting, you're celebrating at the Committee of Melbourne, I think the 25th year this year of your Emerging Civic Leaders Program, the Future Focus Group Program. That's a pretty exciting milestone. Well, it really is. And it's, it's hard to believe that it's a quarter of a century ago, but it is a unique program for Melbourne because its aim is to create the next generation of connected Melbourne leaders. And for a city like Melbourne, which prides itself on an engaged citizenship, if you like, and uh, right up to top business leaders who love the city and want the best for it, it's a wonderful opportunity for people to join other individuals from other organizations to work together to make sure that Melbourne can continue to thrive. So yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful program. It's a, it's a great way of people being introduced to one another, but it's also got a very strong civic purpose. Uh, Martine, many of our viewers being from uh, local government, the majority of them would be familiar with different leadership programs. There's a few different types around. What makes this one different? What do you think is the point of difference for the future focus group? So there are a couple of things. I think most leadership programs, this is this is my impression, uh, it, and, and I, may, I may stand corrected, but they're very much about developing the individual skills of an aspiring leader. Uh, also, um, a, a way of exposing them to uh, other, I guess, other portfolios, other interests, so they become a more rounded leader. So there's a very strong networking element in many leadership programs, but this one is unique because it is very much Melbourne focused. It's about making a contribution to Greater Melbourne. It's about uh, making sure that uh, these leaders can take an interdisciplinary approach to uh, not only their own personal capacity, but to enable them to make a difference to the city in which they're working, which, which has provided them with so many opportunities. Finally, there is a project element that I, I think it's fair to say the Future Focus Group is the only one that has it among the leadership programs that are available here. And that is uh, an idea that you put together, you develop a syndicate, you develop a project that you can then outsource or hand over to another organization for implementation that will leave a lasting legacy for Melbourne. And a couple of the really successful projects that I think Melburnians and other will recognize that came out of the Future Focus Group are, for example, the Free Tram Zone, uh, which uh, is much loved by many, also maligned by some, but, uh, mm -hmm. but it's still a permanent feature of our urban landscape. So the, uh, the Free Tram Zone, the creation of Open House Melbourne. Um, which is a, a wonderful program that is created once a year where a lot of places are opened to be visited um, from, you know, old, old homes right through to modern, fascinating, architecturally exciting buildings. So that's a future focus group project. The creation of the Melbourne Prize for Literature, Music and the Built Form came out of the Future uh, Focus Group, which is one of Melbourne's richest, if not Melbourne's most rich art prize. So those are some really fantastic examples uh, of, the, of the projects that Future Focus Group graduates came up with. One of the more controversial ones, depending on, again, on what side you are, was the equal crossings. You might remember there was a bit of brouhaha in uh, 2017 about the idea that there should be female themed traffic lights installed yes. at the corners of Flinders and, uh, and Swanston Street. Uh, that, uh, but, but that also left a lasting le legacy to the, to, to the effect that they're there permanently. And uh, a lot of younger generations and a lot of younger kids um, really have um, embraced the idea of female themed traffic lights. So that was one of the more controversial ones, but that also really had a very positive message about countering unconscious bias. So it certainly left its mark on the city. And I imagine, um, like other programs, there's an alumni that's built over time and there's probably uh, opportunities for participants to access that alumni in different ways as they work through the program. We have about 500 alumni now, some of whom have become extremely important Melbourne leaders. Uh, if you look at right across the kind of the private sector and the public sector, um, there are many names in leadership roles that are a future focus group alumni. 
We also have a, a wonderful opportunity uh, to connect our alumni to other leadership groups. So as an example, uh, when um, the Asia Society Leadership Program came to Australia, where you've got um, young leaders, uh, including some people who've become heads of their national banks, uh, the, the, the CEO of CNN India, uh, all came to, to Melbourne and uh, had some joint events with the, with the alumni and the Future Focus Group cohort under the uh, patronship of the governor. So the governor of Victoria is our patron. Um, we, she loves the Future Focus Group because she's so interested also personally in developing the next generation of young Melbourne leaders across the board. So it's a great, it's a great network um, and they do still, so, some are more active than others, but it's a great resource to tap into. And the fact that it runs for 15 minutes, uh, 15 minutes, uh, 15 months, I think it, it goes a little bit more substantially in terms of time than some of those other programs as well, which I yes, imagine gives more scope to deliver. Uh, meaningful exactly. So that gives more scope to, to prepare, to you know, properly prepare and to test uh, the idea of, of the project. Uh, it also gives an opportunity to be, to, to work um, on a program which, whilst there is a fair time commitment required, can be easily matched to your full time job obligations. Mm. And uh, so there are workshops, um, I mean, the, the other parts of the program are uh, introduction to Melbourne, introduction to uh, Melbourne leaders, uh, introduction to leadership programs, to great examples of entrepreneurship. I mean, it's, 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 it's multi-themed. And another important plank of the program is that you get to uh, choose a mentor who is uh, among Melbourne's leadership. And uh, the 15 month period really gives you an opportunity to develop a good relationship with that mentor. Mentors are busy people too. It just gives more time for that, that, that part of the program to really have a positive impact. And I know that a number of, of FFG alumni have continued that very productive relationship with their mentor beyond the life of the program. That, that's excellent. Now, before we move on to East Coast Mega Region, um, I know your program intake is happening as we speak and probably needs to be wrapped up fairly soon. From a council point of view, local government, I, I think uh, you've had councils that have been members of committee for Melbourne. Do you have to be a current council member to be able to have um, a, a member of your staff participate in the program? Not at all. In fact, this is a, a really exciting year to be part of the FFG for a number of reasons. First of all, we used to have the opportunity only open to our members, but then we realised that that was counterintuitive because part of the point is to get, and most of our members, as you know, are industry, they're from the private sector, from the universities. There are very few government members because we try to remain independent of government money. So we now have an opportunity, however, for people from the public sector, from councils, from also from government to um, become part of that program in order to build that relationship between industry and the public sector, which I think everyone recognises still sorely lacking and really ought to be built upon bridges, understanding for industry to understand how the public sector works and vice versa. So this is, we, we're opening it up to a much broader, broader cohort this year. The second wonderful opportunity is that we're very much focused in the next couple of years on Melbourne's road to recovery. So the, uh, the, the, in fact, the obligation will be for the project groups to, to focus on something that will actively contribute to Melbourne's road to recovery. And often the FFG focuses in particular on programs with social impact. So I'll give you an example. There are a couple of there, the projects that are running now for the current cohort, are an idea for a Docklands gift that would be open not only to able-bodied runners, but also disabled runners. Mm. The development in conjunction with one of our members then lease of the redesign of Docklands apartments to make them more family friendly for lower cost housing. And the third one, which is super exciting, is called Melbourne Super Highway for Bees, which is actually uh, getting um, helping with the, 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 the building up of our bee population by the greening of Melbourne of the top of Melbourne transports. But, but back to this next intake, um, we will be um, very much focused on getting the projects to, to look at ideas for Melbourne's recovery. We know that Melbourne has taken a particularly bad hit economically and socially in the pandemic. Uh, and uh, so we really want to give those people an opportunity to feel that they've done something really important uh, for, for, for Melbourne's benefit and also for the benefit for their own organisation. 
um, because uh, Melbourne, if, if Melbourne's thriving, then the business that you're involved in is also going to be thriving. The, 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 other, the other introduction that we've made this year is that we're determined to give the opportunity to the, uh, head, the, to the project um, groups to present to a prominent Melbourne identity yet to be revealed, but somebody very, very senior in, in government or in governance to kind of give that extra frisson of excitement and, and incentive to really put together a great project proposal. I can't wait to hear who that person's going to be. So stay tuned. Um, so uh, just quickly, if, if people want to find out more about how to be part of that, what's the best way to go about it, I think? The best way to go about it is uh, to go to our website uh, and to look at um, the um, to, to, to slot into the FFG. You'll see it fairly prominently on our website because we have been um, advertising it on our website. We've also got uh, you can also con look at LinkedIn because we've been sending out a number of posts on LinkedIn. So if you've got a LinkedIn profile, you should be able to find it. And finally, if you can remember this name, Matt Gaffney is our project director and he can be contacted um, through the Committee for Melbourne website as well. But the best place to go, I would say, the quickest and most efficient ways to go via our website. Thank you, Martine, for explaining that to us. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about was the East Coast mega region concept. Now, this has been around for a little while, if I understand correctly, but uh, a lot of people looking at it in a new light, given uh, the events of the past 12 months or so. Yes. Can you just give us the, the, the high level um, brief on what it means uh, to, to talk about an East Coast mega region? So uh, the, well, the, the concept of a mega region, well, it's not just a concept, it's actually a, a very successful configuration for economies in the United States, China, parts of Europe in particular. Mm. Some may remember a, an urbanist and economist called Richard Florida, who published a book um, some time ago where he had uh, looked at the kind of statistics and analyzed that mega regions and mega cities were the most successful economic units in the world. And that even though they only covered something like 18% of the world's surface, they accounted for 65 to 70% of global GDP and 90% of patents. And, uh, and, and uh, they are, and the, the basic characteristic of a mega region is the linking, the integration of cities and populations in a way that uh, enables them to connect and uh, collaborate and generate more economic activity because of the flexibility of capital and people. So that's the kind of economic principle through, and also obviously built, especially not only on digital, digital connectivity, but also on physical con connectivity. So fantastic kind of train systems and fast trains and, and, and ways in which they, they can be connected um, in, in a physical way as well. So when we were looking at um, the, the Committee for Melbourne in 2016 launched a project called the Melbourne 4.0 program. And uh, the purpose of that program was to understand where was the big, and this is pre-COVID, I might add, where was the next big economic shock going to come from that a city like Melbourne needed to be needed to prepare for? And uh, and in 1985, uh, it, when the Committee for Melbourne was formed, that big economic shock was the economy went south very quickly, business and people and money were leaving Melbourne hand over fist, and the, the a couple of very strong leading business and civic minded individuals said we want to roll our sleeves up we want to help we want to work with government to make this work so we were thinking in 2016 where's the next you know where's the next burning platform for melbourne and we decided that, that was the what is broadly known as the fourth industrial revolution and that the impact of technological change was going to outstrip by a factor of, well, an uncountable factor, the impact of things like globalization on the movement of la on, on the movement of capital and labor. So was Melbourne prepared to be able to thrive in the age that was going to be increasingly impacted on by the merging of physical, digital and biological systems, otherwise known as the fourth industrial revolution. Mm. And uh, we thought that that was not the case. And how could we be better prepared, especially for Australia to be a more competitive economic unit in the economically exploding Asia Pacific region. And one of the ways that we saw that this might be possible, um, but also to promote 
the development of the new economy and help Australia move away from resort, you know, the, the kind of um, the mine and the farm was to really um, link up the major cities that already make up 65% of Australian GDP on the East Coast into a mega region. And the broadly, we described that mega region as starting in Geelong and going up to Sunshine Coast. Mm. And that, of course, incorporates Australia's three most already productive cities, but also in particular Melbourne and Sydney, that were also suffering from population explosions that were growing unsustainably. And, uh, and, and so how could you combine preparing Australia better or preparing us, taking the pressure off our cities and all the kind of infrastructure and population and cost of living pressures, whilst also increasing our ability to work productively together to be a better investment destination. And we know that um, especially international investment will go to regions that are integrated, that uh, combine their kind of capabilities and their, the, their complementarities in a way that you don't have to go to one city after another in order to do individual investments. So the idea was to um, help unlock the hinterland between those major cities for to take some of off some of the population pressure to distribute economic activity along that uh, along that uh, along that route to establish um, more um, competitive supply chains by combining the major cities along the coast together as well and also to make um, uh, do things like get you know harmonize regulations right through from from ticketing through to um, uh, transport planning, um, taxes um, on, on development taxes, uh, financial taxes to harmonize some of our systems so that we could be seen as a bigger unit that was a more investable unit, whilst also mm -hmm. providing cheaper housing because you're going to unlock some of the potential through building, for example, a fast train and the value capture that would come with it to establish more opportunities for cheaper housing and also to have people working in those regions rather than all clustering um, in, in, two, uh, in our two mega cities that are becoming rapidly unmanageable. Now in a post-COVID environment, um, people might say, well, you know, migration has sort of gone down to a trickle. Um, the problem we now have is that there are a lot of places that are empty. But if you look at this historically and how long it takes to actually build a unit like that, this is actually the ideal time to do it because you can invest in the infrastructure that you need to do to stimulate the economy anyway, and you can build um, a far more competitive unit for the future when we once again will be one of the most investable places in the world. And we also thought that brief blip of harmony and cooperation between the governments uh, in the, in the, in the, through the COVID cabinet, that now is the time for some of those state governments to work strongly with the federal government to create um, at least, um, uh, you know, a, um, a, a group that might think about what such a mega region might look like and how it might be designed. Exactly what I was going to ask you, my mind goes straight to the, you know, what you'd need to deal with in terms of the barriers to get this sort of thinking happening. Three state governments, federal government, countless local governments along that, uh, that path, I right. guess. How, right. do, how do you get them all together singing from the same hymn book? And you rightly point out the National Cabinet as an example of how um, our different jurisdictions can work together. Is anybody listening uh, to this idea? Look, um, there is uh, the, the, there is one um, politician, uh, John Alexander, who the former tennis player, the now yeah. member for Benelong, yeah. who chairs the uh, one of the parliamentary committees. Uh, it, it's a parliamentary committee that deals with cities and transport infrastructure, and he has long been an advocate of uh, creating um, more connectivity, basically developing in the transport infrastructure to link the Eastern Seaboard in order to unlock, for example, uh, more affordable housing. Uh, but, and, and, he, and he's been a very strong advocate um, for, the, for the creation of a mega region, he doesn't call it that, but for better Eastern Seaboard connectivity in order to, um, to, to build prosperity, longer term prosperity, and affordability for yeah. Australia. So he's a he's a very strong advocate for it. As is the deputy chair Andrew Giles, who is um, a, a, from from Victoria. Uh, so he's the, the the Labor deputy. So those two individuals have been extremely supportive of it and have spoken, we are, as we understand it, um, to to the, to the Prime Minister about this idea uh, and also to others. 
it's not taken, um, I think that under the current circumstances with COVID-19, clearly the political leadership is highly focused on dealing with the health crisis. And uh, to the extent that they're investing in anything, I think most people would agree that they're broadly relatively short-term measures in order to stem the hemorrhaging that might other, otherwise that is occurring in terms of job losses yeah. and business losses. So, um, and, and if, if they're investing in infrastructure, they're only really doing so in a fairly on fairly short term projects. Our other problem is that we don't have the engineering grant, we, we don't have the workforce or the expertise that that to deal with what are already quite a lot of infrastructure projects in particularly in Victoria on the transport front. So it would require a much longer term planning horizon. Uh, but 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 Alexander and Giles have both been very strong at saying now's the opportunity to actually set that thinking in train. This is a long-term project uh, with a number of bits and pieces. You don't necessarily have to start by building stuff straight away. You can look at your entire taxation regime. You can harmonize your, you, you know, one of the very simple things that we said was let's start with tourism. If we are now talking about promoting internal tourism, why not promote one another in one another's markets and harmonize ticketing systems? Why do we have to have a Mikey card and an Opal card? And I don't know what Brisbane has. Why not have, these are simple things that could really so. be the great start. Now, COVID, something new has come along that we at a committee have also been promoting that unfortunately still doesn't have traction, but the Australian Financial Review published an article on it just the other day. One of the big things that everyone obviously needs to think about or is, 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 is very understanding of is to build confidence for people to come back to, to the CBD or to come to work or, or to build confidence that we can deal with COVID or have a new COVID normal, you need first and foremost a reliable tracking and tracing system. Your tracking, your, your, your tracking and tracing system is only as good as the weakest link, the worst tracking and tracing system. I would suggest that what's just been happening in New South Wales recently is that they actually don't have an absolutely foolproof way of knowing where this came from. Federation Uni in, in Victoria has developed an idea that they've done in conjunction with Australia Post and Amazon and GS1, who were the first uh, creators of the QR code, as I understand it, mm. which would be um, like, it's like, a, it's like, an idea, like an Australia card, but it's a card. You don't even need to have an app with all its unreliabilities. You know, people my parents' age who are you know, nearing their 90s can use it, who refuse to use phones. You go with your ID, you go to Australia Post, you get identified, you know, they can verify that the information they've got is correct, not some name that you might make up going into a restaurant if you don't want to be known. Yes. And it goes on a card and you carry it with you everywhere and you can take it everywhere. Transport, retail, interstate transport, restaurants, universities, the works. One system, one, one tracking and tracing system Australia-wide can you imagine how competitive that would make us? Well, it just makes sense, doesn't it? But I can just yeah. hear echoes of the whole the old Australia guard, Australia yes. card argument happening again. But I I agree with you. And listening that was to... in a pre digital world, you know, Chris. I mean, that yeah, was also true. I, I remember because yeah. my predecessor, Australian Red Cross, was Jim Carlton, and he and Robert Ticknett made common cause in the eighties opposing the Australia card. But now most yeah, organisations right. have your information anyway. Why not consolidate it for the good? Very true. And look, hearing you talk all about that, I can hear the passion for the idea, Martine. And uh, to me, that long-term thinking is what's lacking and in some ways um, institutionalised out of uh, the way we do things here because of, uh, because of our political cycles. That, to me, seems a big barrier that we need to get across. And it's heartening to hear that some of our political leaders are on board with trying to find a way to get this longer-term thinking embedded in in what we're doing so uh, congratulations to you for starting the conversation and by the sounds of it getting some traction that's exciting to hear yes so that's a, that one's that's a long burn that one uh, yeah. and and, pl and plenty in it <laughs> indeed it's been great to talk with you martin i'm sure um it would be good to catch up again in the not yeah. too distant future to explore some of those themes a little bit further but for now we really do appreciate your time and being part of our vlga connect summer series Wonderful, Chris. Thanks so much. And Happy New Year to all of you and to VLDA Connect. Thank you.